So thanks so much for coming out on a, a what is it, Wednesday night? Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I, I always kind of have trouble preparing for this stuff because it's so hard to know the kind of technical level of the audience. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you guys are, would you say you're engineers? Got it, so most of you. And like, how many of you use machine learning in your, in your daily job? How many, how many of you have like built a, a machine learning model somehow? OK, cool, that, thanks, that's, that's super helpful. Um, so um, I'll say my, my background um, my background is in machine learning, and I, I, I spent you know, the, the first part of my career doing lots of things to make algorithms better. Um, but then I started Crowdflower, which is a, a training data and human in the loop platform for machine learning. And I wanted to talk about why I think that human in the loop and training data is actually so important for making machine learning work. I was, I was talking earlier to um, some people about you know, what would I work on if I was trying to get into machine learning? You know, like what algorithms would I, would I suggest that somebody learns? And I think it's, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but I was thinking it's kind of ironic, but I would spend maybe the least amount of my time on the algorithms of machine learning, right? I think that's the part that's actually kind of the most well understood. It's where the tools are the best. And it's everything outside of that where it's actually really hard. And where actually, I think people who have really worked on machine learning for years have a lot of skill. Um, but then people that are getting started really, really need to learn this. So I'll show, you, I'll show you exactly what I mean. And I think one of the things that illustrates it the best is this Kaggle competition that we ran um, a few years ago. Any of you guys done a Kaggle competition? Yeah? Which one? Any, any, uh... I did the malware one. Which one? Uh, class malware. Oh, malware class right? Nice. Yeah, yeah, I saw that, yeah. I did class wine prices. Wine prices? Nice. I'm sorry, what competition? Kaggle? Kaggle? Yeah. So, so Kaggle is this website where, um, where you can go and they, they basically, companies will submit data sets and they'll say, um, whoever can model this the best wins a prize. So it's really awesome in that you get lots and lots of people around the world working on your data set and trying to model it the best. So you know, at, at Crowdflower, we have tons of data sets and we thought it'd be fun to submit our own data set to a competition. So we took, a, we took one that our customers care a lot about this is actually search relevance for e-commerce. So saying if I went to a shopping site and I put in a search query, um, how good would my result be? And this is actually the stuff that I worked on um, in industry before I was running Crowdflower. And so I was really interested in how good the results would be. So I mean, Kaggle's amazing. Crowdsourcing is amazing. You put the stuff up and you immediately get people working on it. right? So um, they had a metric of accuracy. And this is basically predicting how relevant a search result is for a search query. And so if you just guessed, you'd get a little bit above 30% right. Actually, if you guessed the most common category, you'd get a little above 30% right. So you could do worse if you randomly guessed. right? But a simple baseline is, is just guessing the most common category. And, and so I submitted that on the 11th of May. And then on, you know, on the 12th of May, within a couple hours, you see that someone's already doing a little bit better than guessing. <laughs> right? So you know, someone's clearly done something with the data set. And this feels really good. And then in the next, uh, the next day, someone got up to 50% accuracy. Right? So you, know, you start to see really quick um, results. And then 14th of May, 15th of May, this gets up to 60%, um, a little above. And I was thinking, you know, I wonder how good this could be. Because you know, the inner annotator agreement on this was about 95%. So um, you know, theoretically, if you had an AI that was as good as humans, you'd get up to 95%. And I was thinking, you know, maybe they'll get to 80%. Maybe they'll get to 90%. I wonder how well people will do, because we had tons and tons of people around the world submitting these, these data sets. But actually, what happened was this. <laughs> right? So you know, after the first uh, four days, in terms of raw accuracy, there was not a lot of progress. Right, so um, you know the best result on the 18th of May, right? That's about a week in, was under 70 percent, and it never got above 70 percent. Um, and so, in terms of raw accuracy, this didn't this didn't improve very much. But actually, in terms of sophistication of the models, it exploded. Right, so this is the number of participating teams over the lifetime of the competition, and you can see that it went up and up and up. 
and actually this doesn't even include the fact that each team was submitting tons of iterations on their model. And actually, I was in the message board, so I saw all of this, right? People were getting really detailed about how we collected the data. They were going into more and more sophisticated systems, more and more feature selection, kind of doing all the things that you'd want to do if you wanted to label data more and more um, accurately, build better and better models. And I was actually amazed. I think our prize money on this was about $20,000. I thought it was incredible how hard people worked um, for this prize, right? So I think we really see state of the art in machine learning, modeling this data set as of a year ago is about 70% accuracy. But you know, if you think about this, and I think that we've all um, seen this curve, I'll show, you one, I'll show you one more kind of famous one from the, do you remember, the, does anybody know the Netflix prize? Any people remember that? So Netflix prize was kind of the first Kaggle competition in a way, so Netflix offered a million dollars for the person that could improve their um, recommendation algorithm the most. And so they actually ran this competition over a couple of years. And you see almost the same exact curve, right? Because it's percent improvement. Um, you know, it, it, basically, um, it basically flattened out right away, right? And actually, there are these points that we didn't have where you can see that there was a breakthrough, right? So you know, people were working on it for months and months and months with no improvement. And these are thousands of teams um, submitting their, their results. And then finally, one team would get a little bit better, right? And it would be like a huge. Um, deal. But in the end, the researchers doing this were like working full time on trying to win this competition. And you know, I think, I think at the time that the Netflix was out, I was working in, in machine learning. I was thinking, you know, um, this is so exciting. It's like so fun to try to make these, these algorithms. But I'll say managing people that um, have returns like this is like maddening, right? Because you know, a week in, you say, okay, I've gone from 40% accuracy to 70% accuracy. What does that tell me, right? If I'm, if I'm writing code, I at least have like some sense that putting more work in will kind of take me closer and closer to bug free or like, you know, ready to ship, right? But with these machine learning projects, you know, you might work another year after you're going from 40% to 70% and you're still at 70% accuracy, right? In fact, we see with, with uh, the competition we ran, that, could, that was probably like 100 or 1,000 man years of work that were put in. Um, with, with basically like zero returns, right? So I think this is one of those things where people find it really difficult to, um, to invest in, in, in projects. And actually you see things where you, you kind of understand why AI goes through these hype cycles, right? Where there's like all this enthusiasm when a new project starts and then the enthusiasm dies off, right? And you get these AI winners, um, <clears throat> which we, we may be headed for again, right? Like this is the, um, this is actually the Google car. So they have this great metric where it's miles per disengage, right? So this is um, how far the car can go before a human driver had to take over and actually grab the wheel <laughs> of the car to keep it from crashing, right? And so you can see that, um, that if you look at the, the four quarters of 2015, they made incredible progress, right? It actually, this has been flat for a long time. And you see that, um, that they're basically doubling the miles between disengage um, each quarter, which is, I think, like this is like a harbinger for um, why self-driving cars have gotten so um, incredibly exciting and, and popular, right? Because you know things are really starting to work. We're kind of at one of those moments in that in that Netflix contest where people are kind of making um, breakthroughs, right? And, and you know, learning's working really well in these vision applications. But if you actually look, I checked um, how far a human goes um, between fatal collisions, and um, it's almost a million miles. Right, so you know, each disengage isn't necessarily a crash. It's not necessarily a fatal crash, but this is still pretty far from a um, a fatal from from basically human level performance, right? And actually, this is driving in Mountain View, right? Which is like I think you almost couldn't pick like a nicer place to drive a car, right? Like people are super polite. I was actually just in India. And like, I can't even, like, I think if you put like one of these self-driving cars in the street, like people would like immediately like destroy it, right? Like, <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's actually a very contained environment. Like it's always sunny. Um, so, so I think like even, even in this environment, you see like interesting progress, but it's really far from being a safe thing to deploy, right? But I think like what, what Tesla and others have done is they said, okay, we don't have a thing that, that 
we can use right now, and we may be really far from a thing that we can use, but we can say, okay, in certain situations, we have really high confidence and it's safe enough, we can actually make a shippable product, right? And so, you know, you see people call it adaptive cruise control. I think Tesla kind of took adaptive cruise control and boldly called it um, a self-driving car. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, highway driving actually works super well, right? And if you have a good system, if you know where it's safe to go, and you have a good system that alerts a human being to take over the wheel, you can actually take a car that's maybe only like 50% accurate, right? Maybe only, it, if it can only drive on the highway, it may only work in like, you know, 50% of the situations that humans actually drive cars, but you can actually make a useful, safe system out of it, not through any algorithm improvements, but through human computer interaction. Right, so that's really what I want to talk about because I think that's like so powerful. And you know, it's my favorite um, example of, of this is um, advanced chess, which is um, something I learned about a while ago. I'm like a huge game player, and Kasparov beating Deep Blue is like a huge moment like in my life. Like I was so excited. Uh, but what's actually amazing, right? If computers got better than humans um, at chess when they beat Kasparov, I mean, that's been like 20 years ago now. Um, I remember watching the games, it was a long time ago, but um, actually up until last year, the best possible system for playing chess involved computers and a human operator, right? So, so actually 20 years went by where humans still had something to add, right? So, so these people would play this advanced chess where they would actually like look at a computer, run multiple computer programs, and they would take over in situations, like kind of closed games, like highly strategic situations that weren't tactical, and they would actually use the things, the situations where humans are better to, to play it better. Right, and so I think that's, it just shows you kind of the lag, right? I mean, it felt like computers really blew by humans in terms of skill, but even a domain like chess, which we now kind of realize is designed for computers to work well, um, humans still had a lot to add for a long time. So I, this, this sort of human loop paradigm exists for a lot longer situation than you'd expect, right? I mean, probably for 20 years before that, for most chess players, having a computer involved would have helped you, right? So there's kind of like a 40-year window where we can actually collaborate. And I guess now chess programs have gotten so good and so effective that um, humans just like screw it up. Um, so, so the best program now is like a, actually a chess program, but it doesn't mean that um, there might be ways to still work together better. I don't think a lot of people are looking into this. So, you know, I think like, okay, what's the, what's the kind of design pattern here that we can take from this, right? Because, you know, these cars, this advanced chess, it all kind of feels like very different, um, very different systems. And so, you know, are we going to have to like kind of come up with something custom for every different kind of application? And I, I think there's some general, um, there's a, like a general design pattern that you can pull from this, which is to basically say, okay, simplest way we can do it, we start with an AI classifier, where it's confident, we use the output. Where it's not confident, we get human annotation. And then we do active learning, right? So it turns out that the places where the algorithm is not confident are actually much, much higher value for training the algorithm, right? So the places where the humans have actually intervened, they're, by definition, cases where the algorithm's struggling, uh, which is actually, we see, and, and there's papers that, that corroborate this, it's like 10 to 100 times better use of your money. Right, so even if you're ignoring this output, right, and all you're doing is trying to make a better classifier, this design pattern is still better because you get better human annotations by picking the cases where the algorithm's not confident. But what you also get out of this is a system where at any accuracy of the AI classifier, it's useful, right? I mean, if you have an 80% accurate classifier, if it knows the 80% where it's accurate, that could mean 80% cost savings. Right, because those cases, if it's confident, those 80% of the times where it's right, you can just use it, right? And, and all good machine learning algorithms have a way that you can infer a non-biased confidence value from them, right? I mean, some of them you have to do like a little more contortions, but every good, every good system you can get, you can basically build uh, this design pattern on top of it. And so I think what this means is that, you know, for lots and lots and lots of applications, this is actually the way that things get deployed, right? Because at, at Crowdflower, what we see is how companies actually take systems and actually launch um, machine learning systems. And there's always a form of this in, in almost every um, machine learning system that we've seen actually get done. So I think this is really something um, that machine learning people really need to think about, right? Because I'll tell you, I think this is probably obvious to the people in the room 
who work on machine learning, but it's not obvious to the, the CEOs of companies that I talk to. That this, this is even possible, right? They haven't thought about this. It's like, you know, they, 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 you know, I think a lot of times people don't trust these confidence values because if you think about human beings, like you should not trust human beings' confidence values, right? I mean, like, you know, there's like that famous psychology effect where like actually like more confidence is correlated with being like less accurate, right? So I think, I think a lot of people who don't work in machine learning have an intuition that it's really dangerous to trust confidence values. But, you know, one advantage of, of AI is there's no ego, so the confidence values are actually useful for you. Um, and I'll just say, like, you know, there's like, I, I feel like a lot of papers that I come across, you really have to kind of squint to see um, the improvements in smart things. Like, even something like deep learning, which can be amazing, right, is often um, kind of subtle improvements. But active learning, right, like picking the examples where the algorithm's not confident is something that's just the, the effect is so massive. Right, I mean, it's like it's like ten or hundred times more efficient use of training data. So, um, you know, for a lot of people, if the training data costs money to collect, that's like ten or a hundred times more efficient use of your money, right? So, um, I'm surprised that there's not more research around this and more thought around it for how um, powerful it is. Um, and I think if you look at kind of like some of the really smart um, successes, you see a lot of active learning. You know, I was talking with the the AlphaGo people, right? And and you know. I think like one thing that's really cool about AlphaGo compared to um, compared to uh, the the deep what was it the chess program deep, deep blue. blue yeah deep blue I mean it's like it, AlphaGo is such a modern approach right like it was trained on um, watching lots and lots of games of of experts right it was actually trained on training data and and I think it's it's actually really interesting to watch the way that it failed right so um, you know deep blue I think it played very computer like. Um, game. Whereas AlphaGo, so I'm a, I'm, a, um, I'm a passionate Go player, wanted to be a professional Go player when I was younger. Um, and so I think I can really say this. Deep, uh, AlphaGo really played like a human being, right? Like I think it played like a very, very good um, human being, but it really played like a human being. And it was interesting too, it made um, mistakes like a human being. So, you know, in game four that it lost, it actually played like a shockingly bad move. Uh, that I think like I think most humans actually like most expert humans would have been able to to catch it and tell it not to do that. So I actually think it's very clear that with Go, even though AlphaGo is clearly better than any human player, I think that at least now um, it would benefit from a human in the loop um, design pattern still, right? And you, you really just saw that in in Game Four where it kind of went completely um, haywire. Um, I think there's another. Um, example of this, which is um, the the postal service. I, I think this is like such a cool example because you know, 1982, they actually launched OCR. I didn't even, I didn't realize this, right? But like they used OCR in 1982, and and it basically only worked if you like printed in exactly the font that they wanted, right? But they were able to get like 10% of like the, you know the huge mailers to just like print like exactly how they told people to print, and so then they were able to OCR it, and that was like awesome for them, right? Because they saved like 10% of their cost by not having to read. Um, the, le the letters. And I was also, I was kind of like looking into this, like geeking out on it. And a lot of people say that with deep learning, um, OCR has gotten better than human beings. And that may be true, but the Postal Service still actually has people that look at um, really badly uh, written <laughs> letters. So the Postal Service still believes that they need to have um, human in the loop. Right? So this is like a, a, a re and, but, but actually, it's, uh, they, have, they, they, they publish the numbers. Um, it's over 99% of the letters that go through actually get read by a computer, but there's still um, there's still exception handling with a person. Um, that would be me. Really? <laughs> no way. Bad <laughs> oh, bad handwriting. Yeah. Well, I, I look at my grandmother's letters. I'm, I'm I'm like wondering, like, man, this this is probably the one that that <laughs> that got a person to. Um, oh, yeah, actually, I was 98% accurate. I wrote this down. So two two percent still get handled by a, a person, and you know they sponsor some of these like handwriting things. So they're they're not like messing around. I mean they really want to make this work, and, and I think it's like kind of funny like postal service launches essentially a machine learning thing in 1982 with human in the loop, and if they had waited for accuracy to be higher than humans before launching uh, an OCR system, they would still be waiting, right? So it would it would be like over 30 years later. 35 years later, they still haven't launched it, 
right? So they were able to like ship this thing 35 years early by doing um, human loop, and they've been like benefiting from it slowly as it um, as it collects more and more data. Um, and then like one thing that we just see a ton of um, is is chatbots because they totally benefit from this this paradigm also, right? It's so frustrating when a chatbot doesn't understand what you're saying. There's so many edge cases, but there's also just so many easy examples, right? I mean, you can make a rule-based chatbot in a lot of cases that catches so much of what people say. But I think to make like an actually human-like chatbot, you basically have to solve all of AI, <laughs> right? So the, the gap's enormous, but you can fill it with, with human loop, right? And so, you know, I mean, not surprisingly, um, Crowdflower that I run is a human loop platform, but and, and so what Crowdflower does is it lets you do all kinds of different labeling, right? setting up jobs where humans can do the labeling, and make sure that it's accurate. Right? So I don't want to give you a sales pitch on Crowdflower, even though I just did. I can't help myself. Because I, I just think it's, like, it's so important. And it's, it's, it's often like the missing piece um, to making the difference between like AI kind of being like a nice idea and something that people um, actually use. And, and we see it over and over. Um, but I'll even show you, like, just like backing up, I mean, this is, the, I'll show you the, the, in graphs the reason that, that I started Crowdflower, which is this. And, and like, you know, I'm a math guy. I worked, um, you know, my first research job was trying to make better algorithms. And it's like incredibly, um, it's incredibly frustrating experience, right? I mean, like, so I just, I took some toy data here on the left and I, I compared Naive Bayes to Maximum Entropy to SVM um, for some, some text classification. And you go from like you know 90% error rate to like 17% error rate with SVM, which is a little more machinery. I mean these days, I've been using these graphs for like years. I, I need to add um, you know some kind of like recurrent neural network to this to like make it uh, modern. But I'm telling you, like that'll be like 16% like accuracy. Like you know, I mean, and and like you know, you you get like 1% accuracy improvements and you you publish a paper. I mean, I have papers published with like less improvement than um, than you see here, right? And but um, and on the right, you actually see kind of the same thing, where it's like, here's a paper where you know, the red line is kind of um, random, like a, a sort of stupid strategy, and the green line is like a smarter um, strategy. And you see it's like, OK, like, you know, there's, there's a, you know, maybe 10% error reduction, and that's like, you know, gets a paper published. Um, and so what you end up doing when you work in the real world, probably what you guys spend most of your time doing, is um, feature selection. Right, because feature selection actually really works, right? So, you know, here I go from unigrams in my data set to bigra bigrams to unigrams and bigrams, and you know, each time it gets a pretty significant um, improvement. And this is like, I think this is what like you know people actually working on machine learning spend like 90% of their time doing, right? It's like, you know, how do we segment this text? Like, should we include all the punctuation? I remember we had a customer that they they recently switched to actually using the emojis in their data set and got this like massive improvement, which like totally made sense in hindsight, you know. But it's like, you know, if you're not really looking at the data, you wouldn't realize that there's like lots of emojis in it all of a sudden that you're encoding wrong. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that like you know you try like a hundred different strategies. For, for feature selection, and like two of them get you that huge effect. And in retrospect, it seems obvious they worked, but it's like, I think no one has a good system um, for like a priori knowing what, what features to use. Um, and you know, deep learning has this promise of you know, kind of doing the feature selection automatically, but that's not what we hear from our customers who are actually really trying to deploy this stuff so far. Um, so, anyway, so people spend all this time on this, um, but there's actually like a thing that you could do that almost always leads to improvement that, for some reason, like, people have like, this mental block. Like, they never think of it, which is just collect more data, right? more training data. And so you know, this is the same data set I was, I was, that I was talking about. And here is about 10,000. So I went from like, 10,000 to 20,000 to 40,000 records that I fed into it. And each time, it actually got more better than doing really good feature selection, and much more better than going from like Naive Bayes, like kind of the stupidest algorithm you could think of, to SVM, which is like a little more um, you know, state of the art, circa like 2000 <laughs> um, algorithm. Um, and I think like this, this, I really like this graph too, because this is from a paper that I think is pretty funny, where um, here are the, the x-axis is how much data they fed in, and the y-axis is the um, accuracy, so down is better. Right? And so what they're trying to show here is that this green line is better than this red line. Right? And that's like the point of the paper. But they're like totally missing this incredibly like obvious effect that they're like accidentally demonstrating, which is that like 
adding more data is causing their algorithms to get like way, way better, right? So their point is that at each fixed amount of data, their green line is better than their red line. But you can actually like duplicate the effect of the paper, which presumably was really hard for them to think of, just by like adding more data, <laughs> right? It's like why did they stop here at, at like 200,000 records, right? It'd probably be cheaper for them to go get like probably cheaper for their boss to go get like another 200,000 records than um, hire them to like <laughs> do their advanced thing that 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 got this lower. So. Um, I mean, obviously, in the real world, you want to do both. But I think it's also kind of telling. You look at like where there's big advances in machine learning. It's like always where there's like massive data sets, right? I mean, like I think like people keep telling me, oh man, like Facebook's like facial recognition algorithm is like so amazing. It's like, well, of course, like they have the most selfies. They have so many selfies. Like they have like a billion labeled records of like faces. Like it makes sense that they have the best facial recognition algorithm, right? Like yeah, they have the best people that do facial recognition at Facebook, but I think they came after they got all that data. And I would say, if they like went to some other company that didn't have all that data, I would still bet on Facebook having the best, <laughs> you know, the best um, facial recognition algorithm. And there's actually one more effect. So I think a lot of people kind of agree with this these days. I feel like two years ago, I was sort of showing this graph and it was controversial or surprising. But there's still kind of one effect that I think people do not study well enough. and actually can't find any academic papers that really talk about this. Um, but I think there should be. Um, which is cleaner data, right? So if you, if you have human collected, human annotated data, it basically always will have errors in it. And so um, you know, one thing that I just simulated with my data set was I, I added errors back into it, right? So I, I, look, I, ran, I built the model on 90% accurate training data versus 95% accurate training versus like perfect training data. And actually, that had the same effect as um, collecting double and double the amounts of, of data. Which is pretty interesting, because it's often easier to clean up your data set than collect twice as much um, new data. So I actually think that, that almost every company that we go into that I talk to, like the best thing I could do for them is like just remind them of, of this. right? So like, I, I think like anyone that's working with data that might be dirty, it's definitely dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and it probably, probably the best thing you could do to make your algorithms work better is go through and root out those errors. Because those errors become the most important pieces of your data, right? Because those are the things that surprise your algorithm, so it ends up learning the most on them. Right? So you know, one thing you could do is actually look at the training data that's affecting your algorithm most. Those are almost always mislabeled um, data. Right? So I mean, even like, just look at the top 10 things that are like, you know, the, kind of the most important data records that you have often. There's, there's, there's always something weird about them if your data set is sufficiently large. And you should definitely look at them, because the effect they can have on, on algorithms is huge. Um, so you know, I think that this is, like, this is um, sometimes surprising to machine learning people, always surprising to um, machine learning people's bosses. <laughs> um, but I think that if you look at like kind of corporate strategies, you can see they kind of agree with it, right? Because like you see basically companies buy data and they open source their algorithms, which I think that shows you what companies care about, right? They give away their algorithms and they, they buy data, right? So you see IBM bought Weather and Watson. IBM bought Merge Healthcare for their data. Facebook open sourced their learning tools. Google open sourced their stuff. Microsoft open sources their stuff. You don't see any companies that give away their data. And I actually think that's a big problem. I mean, we were just talking about this. It's something that I, I care about a lot. I think it's like a, you know, data is such an advantage these days with machine learning that it's become a huge issue for companies that can't get their hands on data, right? Or, or startups, right? That that you know need to compete. They need to get this data. So I mean, one thing that I actually feel really proud of. I mean, there's lots of reasons to not like our government, but I think like one thing that um, I really appreciate our government's doing is is kind of leading. Um, a movement for, for open data, right? So they've open sourced, I mean, all these states actually have open data. Actually, San Francisco is fantastic um, open data that's led to a lot of, a lot of great apps. Um, so it seems like there's a real um, push to open sourcing stuff. So you see, like, you know, like Learn Sprout tracks educational outcomes um, would not be possible without open data. Street Cred actually has a whole system to keep police officers safe. Um, like kind of predicting where there's going to be um, problems. You see um, Public Art Finder just helps citizens find like interesting public art. None of these apps, and these are all good useful apps, they would not exist without um, the government opening up data, right? So I mean, you hate to see the government kind of lead the private sector in terms of um, something useful, right? I mean, in Silicon Valley, that seems like surprising. But clearly, that's happening, right? And you see um, Code for America at the front of this. So, 
one of the things that we wanted to do at Crowdflower that I always want to tell people about is um, we started to open up data. And so, you know, it's one of the data sets is like very beginning of the company. Um, but I think this is a fun one. We basically put like swaths of color and said, what would you call this color? Um, and it led to this awesome cloud. And this is only like 1% of the data that we collected. Um, for 50 bucks, we got so many labels because it's kind of a, a fun task. Um, and we took that, that data set and we put it online. Um, and I'll say by opening up the data, it had the same good effects that open source has, right? Because almost immediately, some guy from SAP went through and he wanted to use the data. So he, he basically cleaned it up. He fixed all the misspellings, removed the typos, right? And actually, there's kind of a bigger effect here, which is that depending on your application, you might actually want the misspellings and the typos, right? So now we actually have two useful data sets, right? There's the original color data set and there's a cleaned up color data set. Both are useful depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then people started to make really interesting um, visualizations off of, off of this stuff, right? So here's a tag cloud where the size of the, um, the colors is how many people set it, right? So you can see like green is like, you know, like just really top of mind for people, right? Whereas like, you know, something like turquoise is smaller, cerulean is like tiny, right? So you can kind of see like what colors native English speakers, um, you know, think of. Um, and, then, and then data visualizations tools start using it as an example because it's kind of a fun one and there's not many good open data sets that visualization tools can actually use to show off their stuff. Um, and then a kid made a, an app for colorblind people where you put a square around something and it tells you not just like the red, green, and blue values of these colors, but like what um, non-colorblind people would call those colors, right? So saying, you know, this is like sky blue and this is navy blue, right? So kind of a rich experience for someone that, that might be colorblind. Um, and so this worked, worked super well, and, and, and we tried it a couple times. Um, we did this thing with um, the Apple Watch, right, where we were, we were labeling tweets about the Apple Watch. And instead of kind of publishing our own you know, results, we thought, well, what if we just gave the raw data to data journalists so we let all journalists just become data journalists if they want to, right? Because the data set's just kind of like handed to them, right? It's just like, hey, draw your own conclusions, like whatever, whatever you want from this. And it was actually super cool, right? So like, you know, the, um, you know, one person does the most obvious thing to say, okay, what's the sentiment of this data set? Um, you know, 55% of the people said positive. So that was like the lead for, for this article. But then, um, you know, someone from Texas just did one that was Texas related, right? Which I thought was awesome. It's just like, Texans <laughs> don't like the Apple Watch, um, if you believe Twitter, right? Which is totally accurate and interesting. And then USA Today did one based on gender, right? So they said, you know, women love the Apple Watch more than men. And like the reason is because um, they think the applications are more useful than, than men think. Um, and so, you know, we were doing that and we were basically like collecting the same data over and over. So this is also like two years out of date, but like we've, we did, two years ago, we've done 11,000 jobs that had sentiment in the title of the job, right? So we do tons and tons of sentiment collection because every job is like, you know, thousands or like tens of thousands of records that get labeled, right? So we're just like, we keep labeling sentiment over and over. And so we thought, what if we just add an option where people could say that they'll make the data available to other people, right? So there's opening it up. And, you know, we did a big launch around it and we actually made, um, we made a, a setting where you could set it. And actually it got a fair amount, in 2014, you know, got a fair amount of results and you can use these, right? So we, we collected like 12 million um, hand label, high quality data rows that you can use to um, build a sentiment uh, classifier or, or um, lots of things. Um, and, and they're all available in our data for everyone library. I think especially like talking to meetups and, and kind of smaller companies, we always really like, I always want to tell you guys, like, you know, I, I remember when we were just starting out and we, you know, we had no funding and no customers and no money, right? And like, you know, we love these like, um, these public repositories. So, you know, we would love for you guys to use it. Um, the license is super generous. Um, but then we did one more thing, which you should also take advantage of, which is we made a data for everyone plan, where if you're willing to make all your data publicly available, which, you know, our, our bigger corporate customers are certainly not <laughs> willing to do, right? So they have to pay license fees. But if you are a startup, say, or, or a researcher, and you are willing to make your data publicly available, then um, we'll let you use our software for free. Um, and so that actually had a hockey stick effect on the popularity of opening up the data, right? So kind of giving people reason to open up the data um, caused us to get a lot more um, records. This is actually um, continued. I think, we're, I think we're over a billion um, data rows of, of open data that you can use. 
Um, and we have an API that, that you should totally hit because there's just like all kinds of interesting stuff in there. I mean, there's like URL categorization tasks. Um, so this is someone paid. They paid um, over seven thousand dollars to the crowd to label. Um, looks like um, almost a hundred thousand websites with the category um, of the websites in their taxonomy, and you know they they made all that data available for anyone that wants to build a, a website classifier. You know, there's all kinds of um, record data from PDFs, which is um, probably boring for a lot of applications. But you know, if you need to build a OCR system or a text extraction system, this would be a fantastic way to to test it. Um, you know, there's name and title extraction, which is one of these things that seems really simple um, until you, unless you've actually worked on it, right? So this is like, you know, saying if if it's Dr. Lucas Bewald, that my first name isn't Doctor, um, and um, summarization, even weird stuff like is an image funny? Um, I mean, this is uh, this is probably this may be the only person that ever wants to use this, but I've had I've seen um, some machine learning classes have tried to um, build this classifier. It's like a particularly tough um, challenge for for deep learning. Um, you know, more seriously, like classifying medical images, um, attributes of people. Um, you know, anyway, all these data sets are available, and um, and we'd absolutely love for for you guys to to use it. So. Um, thank you. So we have time for questions, so I'll just ask Lucas to repeat the questions while they're recording. Sure. Yeah. So it's awesome when you're like uh, having this open data initiative. One question I have is that often classification is the in the eye of the older and it's everyone has their own sets of like taxonomies. Uh -huh. Are you guys doing any work on trying to create uh, an Uber taxonomy or a uh, or normalize taxonomy that also use. Sure. So the question is that is um, is basically everybody has kind of a different taxonomy, a different way they want to classify data, and, and kind of what are we doing about that? And um, I would say um, we haven't looked deeply into it. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that everyone has a different taxonomy, and it's incredibly good for Crowdflower's business <laughs> um, that everyone has a different uh, taxonomy. Um, I, I think um, I think that I guess I guess to be honest, I don't really have smart things to say about it. I mean, it's it's like I think that I would say that here's what I really say is like when when you can use your own taxonomy, it's incredibly um, freeing and and helpful. I think there's a lot of work on trying to like take data that's classified one way and like use that data for a different type of classification. Right, so there's like, you know, I mean, transfer learning in, in a way is like a, a a type of you know thing that 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 kind of leans that way. Um, I think that that's only going to become more and more important because like kind of what we've seen from our customers is that they really insist on their um, taxonomy. So like, you know, we work with like you know Home Depot and Lowe's, right, and they have such similar inventory, but they're never going to collaborate on a taxonomy of hardware, <laughs> you know, because it's just like so fundamental to like. You know what they're trying to do, or, or like you know even like setting aside taxonomies, like you know what's the definition of an address of a business, right? So so many of our customers are like, I want to know the address of the business, right? And I don't think they even realize like how underspecified that is, right? So if like you know the like what's it what is the address of McDonald's, right? It depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to make a map, you might want the McDonald's that's like next door to here, <laughs> right? If you're um, trying to like sell McDonald's some software, like you might want their like international headquarters. If you know you want, you know, you might want like a mailing address. I mean, it's just like there, there's so many different ways that that um, that that can mean. I think it's a. Uh, I just think it's incredibly hard to to figure out how to how to combine them. So I guess I don't have any um, genius way to do it. But if you do, you should. Uh, <laughs> you could probably make a great business. I mean, it seems interesting because I think if you're in a unique position because you have the most insights on each person's taxonomy. Ah, yeah. You're just seeing all the data sets. Right. So I feel like in some ways you have an interesting position of being able to specify what is the right taxonomy given that you've seen all these data sets. And you couldn't kind of describe what the ideal taxonomy should be. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I think the problem is that ideal taxonomy depends so much on what you're doing. If we don't know what somebody's kind of doing downstream from us, it's, it's hard for us to say, like, you know, we could say, like, what's the taxonomy that people can understand and classify? Um, but that might not be what somebody actually wants. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this stuff is really interesting. Yeah? Can you explain a little more about how you're supposed to your participants and more specifically how you have a graph 
Sure, sure. Um, so the question is around the, um, you know, who, are the, who are the kind of people doing the, the work on the back end? Um, and I would say, you know, we started off as a very pure, um, you know, kind of open platform where anyone could log in and start earning money and, and kind of like an open marketplace where people would just post prices and people would log in. Um, and we got all types of different um, people doing that. So, um, so it was a really broad demographic. I mean, we actually published a bunch of um, studies on the demographics, but you know, it turns out it's like you know half men, half women. Like, kind of follows the you know, if you look at by state, it follows the population of states. Um, it's about uh, half the folks in the U.S. have a college degree. Um, but then you know, we had a lot of customers that said, hey, you know, we care a lot about the demographic. Um, distributions of the, the, the we care a lot about the demographics of the people that are, are doing these tasks in the back end. So, what we did was we actually partnered with a whole bunch of um, outsourcing companies, and and we basically say, hey, if you want to send this to a particular um, outsourcing company or even a particular group of people, like your own employees, um, you can do that, right? So you can, um, if you want to send it to. Um, you know, if you want to send it to a particular company in India where people are just like doing this labeling all day long, you can totally do that. If you want to send it to like veterans, um, you can you can do that. And if you want to, if you want just like a link that you can pass around, you know, among your your team and just like you know say, hey, can everyone like label a hundred of these? Um, you can also do that. So um, so I think it's like absolutely true that the the demographics of the people um, matters a ton. But it's maybe sort of similar to the taxonomy question in that it matters a ton, but there's not like a right solution for like any particular person. It kind of depends on what on what you're trying to do. Like, you know, if you're trying to get um, you know, if you're trying to label um, if you're trying to if you're like a fashion company that wants to like label all the dresses in your inventory, you probably want like a really different kind of person than um, you know, if you're Home Depot trying to label like all the um, you know, all the hardware in your inventory. And and that's just like that would almost look like the exact same task, right? So, you know, because that's just sort of like categorizing inventory. So we kind of rely on our customers and our to use our tool to to get the right uh, demographics to get the results they want. Yeah. I'm, I work for a bunch of years with Goldman Sachs, like long-term strategies, where we had just a ridiculous time. We had every single trade, every single market since the beginning of the So we weren't short of. So I guess the question is, um, you know, I'm talking a lot about kind of like classification and <clears throat> maybe not like kind of like prediction of the future. Um, you know, again, like I think I think I think people often talk about classification as um, you know because it's kind of the, the the simplest application of machine learning. I think I think in practice um, things get a lot more complicated. Um, you know, I think. Um, I mean, the, the way I would look at, at prediction is sort of, um, you know, kind of taking, you know, taking all the data I have up to like a certain time, and then, you know, trying to trying to classify or trying to do a regression on, you know, the next set of data that I have. Like that's how I would kind of frame the the prediction problem. But, um, you know, I actually think there's probably like a lot a lot of folks here that are, you know, kind of more qualified than me to talk about, um, you know, prediction in in general. So, I, you know, I'm not sure that. Um, I mean, I think I think. I would say, I think a lot of customers, a lot of our customers, are doing things that you'd probably call prediction that they might call um, classification and, and vice versa because it's there's a lot of overlap. But um, in terms of like time series analysis, I mean, I guess some of our customers do it, but it's not my area of expertise. So probably I don't have too much smart to say about uh, okay, your question. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just try to get, get 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think like you should definitely ask all the people that raise their hand saying they work on machine learning here, because it was like almost everyone. Um, I, I think like one thing that's frustrating about AI is um, the language is so unnecessarily confusing, and you know, I think a lot of things that are simple get kind of highfalutin terms um, attached to them, and so I, I think that's terrible. So um, I think like once, yeah, I, I would just ask ask everyone here, yeah. Maybe, maybe you guys can can help out this this man over here. <laughs> Anyone's interested in prediction? <clears throat> uh, I kind of feel like I should uh, let let uh, let you guys see the next talk and then go home. Thanks.